Tonight, a travel nightmare as the country deals with its third winter storm just this week. Planes covered in ice on a runway in Omaha, Nebraska, as a so-called bomb cyclone brings whiteout conditions to the Midwest. Thousands of flights canceled across the country. A ground stop issued at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. More than 50 million Americans still in the storm's path and now potentially life-threatening cold moving in. On Monday, caucus goers in Iowa could be met with wind chills nearing minus 40 degrees. Also tonight, Houthi rebels vowing to retaliate after U.S. and British-backed strikes targeted the group in Yemen. The U.S.-led attack was launched in response to Houthi rebel bombardments on commercial ships in the Red Sea. Could the strikes lead to something bigger? And will they have economic impacts both overseas and at home here in the U.S.? Emergency in Ecuador. The country declaring war on gangs following the on-air attack at a TV station in Guayaquil. Homes raided and suspected gang members rounded up. Ecuador's new president sitting down for an exclusive interview with Telemundo's Julio Vaquero. Why he says the country went from one of the safest in the region to one of the most dangerous. Back here at home and the cold case twist. A local NBC News crew in 1989 capturing the moment a father found his missing son's body. The man breaking down in tears on camera. But now 35 years later, he's charged with that child's murder. How some of that old NBC News video helped investigators finally crack the case. Body camera footage showing officers running into a burning home, finding a man stuck in a chair that was engulfed in flames. The race to get him out alive. Top story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber, in for Tom Yamas. Tonight, tens of millions across the U.S. facing a third round of brutal winter weather. A potent bomb cyclone blasting parts of the eastern U.S. with blizzard conditions and sub-zero temperatures. The storm taking aim at Chicago, forcing hundreds of cancellations at O'Hare Airport and thousands of disruptions nationwide. Meantime, to the south, a risk for severe storms, including the threat for tornadoes stretching from parts of Arkansas up to Raleigh, North Carolina. This system will continue its brutal path east, bringing heavy rain and destructive winds to the I-95 corridor tonight and into tomorrow. A cruel reality for much of the Northeast as already saturated areas are prone to even more flooding. The bitter Arctic blast behind this system will send temperatures plunging well below zero. Tomorrow's Dolphins chief game could break records for the coldest NFL playoff game in history. Bill, Car Bill Karen's with the forecast in just a moment, but we're going to begin with NBC's Maggie Vespa tonight from Chicago. Tonight, the brewing bomb cyclone already living up to its name and derailing travel plans coast to coast. How wild is it to see delays and cancellations stack up that quickly? I was shot. We boarded twice and we got on the plane, we got off. Whiteout conditions slamming the Midwest, dumping up to two inches of snow per hour and coating planes on this Omaha runway in ice. In Chicago, the storm forcing a temporary ground stop at O'Hare, funneling frustrated passengers into long customer service lines. Effects rippled quickly. Tonight, more than 6,000 flights delayed, more than 2,000 canceled nationwide. Among the stressed out travelers... So you're just stuck here. I'm stuck here. Shash Savaram, whose plane from Florida was diverted, making her miss her connection to India to see family. How stressed are you right now? Extremely. I was excited to go meet my, my mom. <laughs> 60 million Americans tonight remain under new winter weather alerts, 125 million under wind alerts. Roads across the Midwest also a mess. Here, visibility in Kansas practically down to zero. Wisconsin, meanwhile, slammed with more than 10 inches of snow and counting. Two snowstorms back to back feels like a little much. I have never seen anything like this before. The storm now roaring east. New York's governor even urging Bills fans to avoid Sunday's playoff game against Pittsburgh. We're anticipating at least 18 inches of snow. It's just better if you stay home and tune in on television. It'll be safer for all of us. A plea for safety amid America's third severe winter system this week. And Maggie Vespa joins us now from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. Maggie, what's the latest on those air travel delays and cancellations? 
I mean, Ellison, you saw those staggering totals in the piece, right? It brought yeah. no surprise. I mean, they've been rising pretty much all day. And unfortunately, we've seen this before to some degree. This is kind of a broken record when it comes to air travel, sort of um, butting heads with severe weather. This could take several days for this mess to kind of resolve itself. In the meantime, with this storm still on the move, the FAA says it's on alert, working with airlines to monitor the storm's impact on flights through the weekend, if not into next week. Allison. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa in Chicago. Thank you. For more on those severe winter weather threats, let's turn now to NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens, who joins me in studio. Bill, I know you are tracking two separate storm <laughs> systems. What are you watching? Yeah, it's getting confusing just keeping track of all these storms one after another. So we have our blizzard that we've been watching all day long. That's the one that's moving over the top of Chicago now. The back side of it's the nasty side. That's where the winds are howling. That's where the snow is light and powdery and blowing all over the place. Roads are extremely difficult, if not impossible, in much of Iowa. And then and now in areas of Wisconsin, earlier in Kansas and Nebraska, it was really bad, too. Michigan is not as windy, but it is still snowing pretty hard, especially in the northern half of the state. And this is just all rain rain that is heading up the East Coast. So as far as the watches and the warnings go, the purple shows you the blizzard warnings. Even though it's not snowing anymore, it's like a ground blizzard because the winds are so strong there in areas of Nebraska and South Dakota. Green Bay, first time in five years under a blizzard warning. And then this is the new storm that we're going to be watching all weekend. With all the winter storm warnings from Salt Lake City, blizzard warning southern Idaho, that's mostly going to be a heavy event in the mountainous areas. And one of the stories we're going to be watching, not only what happens with this storm overnight, but Buffalo. One to two feet of snow in that football game on Sunday with 60 mile per hour winds. Oof. All right, Bill, temperatures, they are set to drop dangerously in the heart of the country this weekend. How cold are we talking when we say really, really cold? It's cold as we've been in a, this winter, but for sure in some areas even longer than that. So this is the current wind chill. It's negative 42 in Montana. It's been that cold all day, just brutal. And now it's heading to the south. Notice Nebraska, negative 16. Kansas City's the 10th. Wichita's the 6th. And this will eventually make its way all the way down to the Gulf Coast. And it's here to stay. It looks like it's going to peak on Sunday or Monday in many places, including in Idaho for the in Iowa for the caucus. Kansas City for the football game, negative 20 wind chills. And watch out. Texas on Monday and Tuesday near record energy demand. And we all know what happened a couple winters ago, Allison, uh, when Texas had the power outages in the midst of an extreme cold snap. Yeah, I was on the ground covering that really scary situation. We hope everybody stays as safe as they can. Bill Karens, thank you as always for bringing us that. We head now to Iowa, where candidates are battling bitter cold and snowstorms as they make their final pitches to voters ahead of Monday's Republican caucus. Donald Trump still holding that commanding lead we've been reporting on and gaining strength with a key group of voters. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake is on the ground in a frozen and snowy Des Moines. Tonight, the final sprint towards Monday's Iowa caucus, frozen by the blizzard sweeping across the Hawkeye state. Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley urging supporters to turn out Monday, no matter the record cold caucus forecast. I don't think you'll ever be able to cast a vote that has more impact. It's going to be negative 15, but I'm going to be out there. DeSantis and Haley still seen in a race for second to frontrunner Donald Trump, who holds a key advantage. Raise your hand if this is the, you're going to caucus for Donald Trump. All three of you. The most recent NBC News Des Moines Register poll shows 63% of first time caucus goers, often new to politics or new to Iowa, plan to support the former president. I look at everybody, but he's uh, my, only, my only choice. Trump's ability to recruit first time caucus goers like Leroy Schnothorst and turn them into active volunteers, key to his strength here. I just want to support Trump because he's putting American first, and that's. The biggest reason why I'm out here. But Trump isn't alone in drawing new caucus goers. Ryan Clares voted for Joe Biden in 2020. Now he's crossing over to caucus for Nikki Haley. Yeah, I feel like there needs to be a new generation that comes in the White House. It can't be Trump or Biden. Garrett Hake joins us now from the campaign trail. And we should note a very snowy Des Moines, Iowa. Garrett, thank you for being with us and reporting despite all of that snow and wind around you. Uh, look, talk to us a little more about what you talked about in your piece. I mean, we see the weather. It has obviously been a factor on the trail all week there in Iowa. We understand candidates are actually still canceling some events. 
Yeah, that's right, Ellison. It's been a full on blizzard here today with the snow and the wind making it incredibly treacherous, even for Iowans who are used to winter being winter here. All of the campaigns have had to cancel at least some of their events today. We're hearing word that there could be more cancellations to come tomorrow. If you had to place a bet on it, you have to think all this probably helps Donald Trump, the front runner. His supporters are so committed to him. And it's those candidates, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, who need to find a way to shake up this race, going to have a much harder time doing it when they can't physically go out and meet those caucus goers here in Iowa because of all this snow. Allison. Garrett Haig in Iowa, thank you. And you can join our Tom Yamas, Hallie Jackson, and Kristen Welker for live coverage and analysis of the Iowa caucuses. Special coverage begins Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, streaming on NBC News Now. Heading overseas now to Yemen, the Houthis vowing retaliation for the airstrikes launched by the U.S. and Britain. The attack coming after weeks of mounting attacks by the Iranian-backed militant group in the Red Sea. The Houthis saying the attack killed at least five fighters at multiple rebel-held sites. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby has the latest. Tonight, after the Pentagon says a punishing series of U.S. and British strikes destroyed more than Houthi military targets in Yemen, the first sign of retaliation. The Iranian-backed militia saying they won't stop attacking ships, firing an anti-ship ballistic missile into the Red Sea, but hitting nothing. President Biden was pressed, what would he do if Houthi attacks don't stop? We will make sure that we respond to Houthi as they continue this outrageous behavior along with our allies. President Biden has been under pressure to act following months of Houthi attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea through which the U.S. says 15% of global sea trade travels, including oil supplies. And some companies had begun avoiding the Red Sea, a costly disruption. Last night's operation included U.S. and British warplanes dropping bombs and U.S. Navy ships, including a submarine, firing Tomahawk missiles. More than 150 precision-guided bombs and missiles in all. The White House says they demolished Houthi ballistic missile launchers, ammunition warehouses, air defense radars, and more. The targets we chose uh, were all valid, legitimate targets that went right at the Houthis' ability to store, to launch, uh, and to guide. President Biden writing, the strikes send a clear message that the United States and our partners will not tolerate attacks on our personnel or that imperil freedom of navigation. But tonight, Iran, who supplies the Houthis with money, weapons and intelligence, condemn the strikes, saying they are fueling instability in the region. I do. Meanwhile, President Biden criticizing Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin for keeping his hospitalization secret. Austin did not tell the president or the public for days that he was off the job and in intensive care for prostate cancer treatment. Was it a lapse in judgment for him not to tell you earlier? Yes. And Courtney QB joins us now from the Pentagon. So, Courtney, in terms of these strikes in Yemen, we have the United States, John Kirby, other top officials saying these are meant to be a deterrent, but also we expect to see some sort of retaliation from Houthi rebels. They've warned commercial ships not to go into the Red Sea with an American flag, at least in the coming days. So what sort of retaliation are they expecting? I mean, do they think commercial ships will be safe or do they expect that to be the retaliation here? So the big question is, how big of a real impact did these punishing strikes last night have on the Houthis' capabilities? So keep this in mind, Ellison. There were more than 150 precision bombs and missiles that were fired at these targets last night. More than 60 actual targets were hit. So you would think that would have, and Pentagon officials think, that had a real impact on the Houthis' capability to conduct some of these larger scale attacks that we've seen in recent days, like frankly earlier this week, when they fired off more than 20 projectiles into these busy shipping lanes in the Red Sea. The belief is they really degraded that capability, but it doesn't mean they have completely eliminated their capability, and that's what we should be watching for for the next several days, and maybe even weeks, Ellison. Do they still have the ability to launch off drones, to fire ballistic missiles, and to fire anti-ship uh, cruise missiles? And that's the kind of retaliation that the, the Pentagon is expecting to see in some form or fashion. All right, Courtney Kuby at the Pentagon, thank you.
for more on these strikes and what they mean for the future of the region. I'm joined now by Steve Warren, a retired United States Army colonel and former Pentagon spokesperson. Colonel Warren, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, look, earlier today, we heard a lot from John Kirby, the National Security Council uh, coordinator for strategic communications. He basically said, from the White House's perspective, we are not looking for conflict with Iran. But there is concern that this could lead to something bigger. I was struck by a statement Michigan Representative um, Slotnick put out today on her Twitter account, where she did say that she felt like this was the right move, but she went on to say, quote, we should be worried about regional escalation. Iran uses groups like the Houthis to fight their battles, maintain plausible deniability, and prevent a direct conflict with the U.S. or others. They've done it for years. It needs to stop. And my hope is they've gotten the message. My question here is, by launching these strikes, did the U.S. walk into some sort of trap here? I mean, Iran knows what they're doing, right, presumably. So did the United States take sort of the exact steps that Iran wanted them to? Well, it, it remains to be seen, Allison. Uh, generally speaking, or geopolitically speaking, I think the conversation that you had with with Courtney was particularly uh, important, right? There's, as we look at possible retaliations, you, there's really two sort of tiers to that possible retaliation. One is the Houthis. Their capabilities are relatively limited. They can continue striking shipping uh, in the Red Sea. Uh, they can escalate. They could strike a little bit more than they have been. But that's really about all the Houthis are capable of. The Iranians, as you point out, have much more capability. They have a broader range. They can conduct operations in Iraq and Syria and other areas throughout the region. So we have to wait and see. There is an argument to be made that, the, you know, the strategy behind these strikes, which I think you can break it sort of down to three Ds, right, deter, you know, de-escalate and degrade, will have that effect, right? The Houthis now understand that their actions will have consequences as the president, as other members of this coalition that conducted these strikes I have said publicly, uh, these can't continue. This type of disruption of the shipping lanes can not continue. Mm -hmm. and, and now the Houthis and the Iranians, frankly, understand that there will be consequences mm -hmm. uh, if they continue. Understanding there might be consequences, caring that there might be consequences are sort of two different things. I'm curious, when you look at the Houthis, and I understand you're saying that their capabilities are nothing like Iran, certainly nothing like the United States, but this is a militant group that has a lot of experience fighting within Yemen. I mean, they have been fighting a Saudi-backed coalition since, what, 2015? Prior to that, when they formed in the mid-90s, they'd spent decades, years fighting the government in Yemen. They're a Shiite group. They were fighting the Sunni government there. I mean, are they more capable than, say, Hezbollah or even Hamas? And do you think when they are looking and weighing the benefits here, do they approach it like a normal military would, where even if they don't have the same capabilities as Iran or the U.S., they say, we don't care, we'll go to the wall anyways? Right. Well, two things there. Number one, their capabilities have uh, increased significantly over the last 10 years. Uh, you know, when, when they started out, you know, what we would see is images of, you know, some ragtag fighters with, uh, you know, rusty rifles and assault rifles. And now they are, you know, a full-fledged, really, military, right? They have all the sort of regional or local capabilities that you'd expect uh, in a military, armored vehicles, some air power, uh, and, of course, all the missiles that they have. So they do have those capabilities, but they're also regular you know, have to think about what's in their interest, right? Mm -hmm. They've lost, they, you know, they took, a, I think, a significant uh, hit today. Ha was, the, was the U.S., this coalition strike, able to uh, eliminate their offensive capabilities? Of course not. Uh, but they, they, they've bled a little bit, right? And so the Houthis now have uh, some new calculus that they have to figure in. As they are going through their decision process, they have to determine whether or not whatever they think they're gaining out of these, you know, harassment strikes that they're conducting in the Red Sea, whatever it is that they think they're gaining, is it worth the price they're paying? And that's really, you know, the formula for deterrence anywhere. It's causing the enemy to determine or to think twice uh, before they act. All right. Colonel Steve Warren, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and insights tonight. Thank you. We continue to follow that state of emergency in Ecuador, the country in the midst of a massive crackdown on gangs following prison riots, kidnappings, and that TV station attack. The violence has left the country on edge and has even forced the cancellation of flights from the U.S. NBC News correspondent Guad Venegas has the very latest. 
Tonight, Ecuador presses on a war against criminal gangs now designated by the government as terrorists. Soldiers patrolling the streets in Guayaquil, the country's largest city and epicenter of the violence. On Tuesday, a horrific 30-minute attack on a television station broadcasted live and seen by the world. Forcing the country's president, Daniel Novoa, to double down at a state of emergency. No vamos a dejar que un grupo de terroristas detenga el país. Guayaquil still crippled with fear as 90% of stores in the downtown area remain closed. Personas casi no transitaron mucho, igual ayer no se elaboró por la misma inseguridad. For now, even some U.S. airlines have decided to temporarily halt flights to Guayaquil with experts asking Americans to reconsider travel. Don't go unless you have to. If these gang members are doing this you know, outside the sort of the, the prison system or or outside of fighting each other, there's an increased risk of civilians being sort of caught in the crossfire. In an effort to restore peace, the police publicly display alleged gang members they have arrested. Aquí tenemos ocho personas también detenidas que van a ser judicializadas por el delito de terrorismo. The tensions also spreading beyond Guayaquil. Authorities reporting arson at a nightclub in the Amazon city of Coca killing two people. A bomb scare causing a mass response in Ecuador's capital, Quito, and nearly 160 prison guards still being held hostage by inmates at at least seven prisons, according to the nation's prison agency. This woman, who was scared to show her face for security reasons, says she's the wife of one of the abducted guards and has had no information about her husband's whereabouts for five days. President Novoa sitting down with Telemundo's anchor Julio Vaqueiro today for an exclusive interview. Ecuador was one of the safest countries in the region. And today, it's one of the most violent places in the world. What happened? The lack of security is based on what has happened politically in the previous years. We have let these international organizations and these terrorists uh, gain ground and insert themselves in various institutions. You said that Ecuador is at war. How will you win this war? And we have received full support also of the people, not only on the of the political class. And together with uh, working you know, hand in hand, we will succeed and we will have a victory. Guad joins us now from Houston, Texas. Has the international community offered any sort of support to Ecuador's president, particularly the United States? Ellison, the United States is offering very specific support. The State Department now informing the group of senior officials from the U.S. will be traveling to Ecuador in the next uh, coming weeks. And the support they will be offering is a number of things. They're going to offer intelligence. They're also going to offer help when it comes to prosecuting these individuals and also with the criminal investigations, as well as help with the cyber activity, that malicious cyber activity that the criminal organizations are engaged with. And also, they're going to help with the prison reforms. One of the biggest problems in Ecuador has been with the prisons. So this is all coming from a group of experts from the U.S. that will be traveling to Ecuador. Elson. Guad Venegas, amazing reporting. Thank you. Still ahead tonight, falsely accused, a deputy with a heart condition going into cardiac arrest and dying after trying to detain a man outside of a motel. Now that man has been charged with manslaughter and could face life in prison. Plus, the father charged with the murder of his son 35 years after he was caught on camera pretending to be the one to discover the body, how some of this old news footage might have helped crack the case. And some student loan borrowers will have the rest of their debt erased starting next month. We'll explain the new announcement from the Biden administration. Stay with us. Back now with a break in a decades-long cold case. A South Carolina father now charged with the 1989 murder of his own five-year-old son. Investigators pointing to scientific advancement in forensic and a TV news crew's videotape from the scene of the crime that could indicate what the father knew. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson has this report. In 1989, Five-year-old Justin Turner went missing on his way to school. Try to see if we see one end or the other end, see if he might be in there. Local and state law enforcement in South Carolina combing the area where Justin was last seen. Two days later, 
My son's in there. Nathan, that's no, no camera, no camera. Justin's father, Victor Lee Turner, finding his son's body in a camper on the family's property. Almost 35 years later, Victor Lee Turner now charged with the murder of his own child. I can't think of a more tragic, horrendous murder. Five-year-old boy. Also charged with murder, Justin's stepmom, Megan Turner. Initially, they provided information that he got on the school bus and went to school, but never got off of the bus. That was not true. He never got on that bus. He never got on that bus because he was dead inside that house. The decades-old case reviewed in 2021 by the Berkeley County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit. We have a lot of forensic evidence. Uh, we got here because of new technology and forensic medicine. And we kept pushing and plugging and pulling to finally get what we needed. Another element investigators have been looking at for decades, this 1989 news video from the search captured by NBC affiliate WCBD. The Berkeley County Sheriff pointing to the way Victor Lee Turner enters the camper during the search. It indicates, at least to me, that and, and, and a lot of investigators that he knew where he was at because he, he went straight to him. And, you know, again, you have to make that determination for yourself. But um, that's, that's what it appears to us. Victor and Megan Turner appearing via video for their first court appearance. The couple has yet to make a plea. Justin's cousin making this statement to the court and the couple. For 35 years, you have enjoyed your freedom. You do not deserve one day outside of those prison walls for what you did to Justin. You were supposed to take care of him, love him, and instead you tortured, abused, and murdered him. Your child. It takes a sick individual to do what you did to that baby, and I hope you never see life outside of those prison walls. And so far, bond has yet to be set for Victor and Megan Turner by a circuit court judge. We expect that within the next month. Ellison. Steve Patterson, thank you. Next tonight to an arrest that took a deadly turn in Florida. A deputy going into cardiac arrest and dying after trying to detain a man outside of a motel. Now that man, a Guatemalan farm worker, has been charged with manslaughter and is facing 30 years in prison if found guilty. NBC News correspondent Stephen Romo has this report and a warning to viewers. The video of the arrest, it is disturbing. This is the moment last May that changed everything for the two men involved. Sergeant Michael Kunovich stopped Guatemalan farm worker Virgilio Aguilar Mendez for, quote, suspicious behavior outside a motel where he was staying in St. Augustine, Florida. After a struggle to arrest Aguilar Mendez, who tried to flee, according to law enforcement, Sergeant Kunovich went into cardiac arrest and died a short time later. Florida's state attorney's office is now charging Aguilar Mendez with aggravated manslaughter of an officer, and he's facing 30 years in prison. Our client's uh, constitutional rights were violated. He was a victim of police brutality, a victim of racial profiling. Now his attorney is demanding all charges be dropped, or he says they'll sue in federal court. He was eating outside. He had... Um, also been planning on going towards the gas station to get a bottle of soda. Body camera footage given to NBC News by Aguilar Mendez attorney shows how the encounter unfolded. You can hear Aguilar Mendez saying multiple times that he doesn't speak English. Don't walk away from me. Don't pull away from me. Sergeant Kunovich continues yelling commands to him in English, and Aguilar Mendez appears to pull away when Kunovich tries to search him. Get on the ground! The struggle continues, and another officer arrives. No, familia. These next images are disturbing. I'm gonna tase you. Another officer putting his hand on Aguilar Mendez's throat, throwing him to the ground. Put your hands behind your back. Kunovich tasing him while he's down. With Aguilar Mendez repeating that he doesn't understand. Man, stomach. Sorry, not speak English. He ends up tased multiple times with officers tackling him and twisting his arms back. One officer also appears to place his knee on Aguilar Mendez's torso. After Aguilar Mendez was in handcuffs, officers found what appeared to be a small pocket knife, which his attorney says he uses for cutting melons. Aguilar immediately told the officer he didn't understand English. His native language is MAM, which is an ancient indigenous language in Guatemala. 
At the end of the body cam video, Kunovic's breathing appears labored, and a colleague asks if he's okay before he was taken to a hospital where he was later pronounced dead. St. John's County Medical Examiner determining Sergeant Kunovich died from an irregular heartbeat caused by the hardening of his arteries, along with high blood pressure and heart disease. The report also said, quote, physical exertion and possible emotional stress while apprehending a fleeing suspect may have contributed to his death. Even if Kunovich hadn't, as you said, tragically died from this, would you still think that Rahelio would have a civil rights case to pursue? I do, because his constitutional rights to be free from unreasonable search and seizures, um, which apply not only to citizens, but persons, the Constitution is very clear. It says persons, not citizens. Stop. Aguilar Mendez is currently waiting for his asylum hearing in immigration court. The St. John County Sheriff's Office has not returned NBC's request for comment and Florida State Attorney's Office saying they don't comment on pending cases. Ultimately, Sergeant Michael Kunovich succumbed basically to some medical issues that actually were induced by the struggle with our subject. After seven months in custody, a judge last month ruled Aguilar Mendez to be incompetent, something that typically happens due to mental health. But his attorney says it's so he can have time to understand the charges and the U.S. legal system, adding he only has a sixth grade education in Spanish, which is his second language. To charge our client with his death is outrageous, and it's just not supported by the law. Stephen Romo joins us now in studio. So, Stephen, what happens next here? How likely is it that these manslaughter charges will be dropped? And what are experts telling you about the strength of this case? Well, today was the deadline the attorney set for those charges to be dropped before deciding to file that civil rights lawsuit. So it seems like that is the next step. As for the case itself, our legal expert, Danny Savalo, is telling me it's likely the defense will try to show that the deputy had a heart condition that preceded this event with the suspect, but that will happen once the court case actually takes place. But for right now, Aguilar Mendez is in limbo because he's been found unfit to stand trial at the moment. So the sheriff involved in this in St. John's County is running for re-election. What has the reaction been to him, to that, and this incident within the community? We have here at NBC tried to reach out to the sheriff's office and get comment, as have other outlets, and they've not really spoken much at all since right after this incident occurred way back in May. So we would like more information about that. He is running for re-election, and many of the people in the community are supporting the deputy's family, holding fundraisers for them, so there is a lot of support. But since the video, the body cam video has been released, there's a lot of attention on this from immigrant rights groups saying that there was not a decided suspicious behavior for the stop to begin with, something many people are asking the sheriff and the sheriff's office to answer for. Stephen Romo, thank you. When we come back, an update on a case we've been following out of South Korea. One of the stars of the Oscar-winning movie Parasite found dead last month in an apparent suicide as he faced a grueling investigation into his alleged drug use. Why the director of that film is now calling for major change. Back now with Top Stories News Feed. We begin with an update in the federal case against the Buffalo supermarket shooter. The Justice Department now planning to seek the death penalty for the white gunman who killed 10 black people at a grocery store back in 2022. He was indicted on 27 federal counts of hate crimes and firearm offensives. He is already serving a life sentence without parole after pleading guilty to murder and hate crime charges last year. A dramatic rescue caught on camera just outside of Detroit. Body camera video shows an officer breaking through the door of the smoke-filled home to find a man sitting in a chair engulfed in flames. Two more deputies arrive on the scene with fire extinguishers, eventually putting out the fire. The two people inside the home were taken to the hospital and are expected to be okay. Authorities are still investigating the cause of that fire. And the White House announcing today that some student loan borrowers will see their debt forgiven earlier than expected. The Biden administration announced borrowers who signed up for the SAVE program will have debt erased starting next month. That's several months ahead of schedule. It will only apply to borrowers who took out less than $12,000 in federal loans and who've been paying that balance off for at least 10 years. 
We're back now with a high stakes presidential election this weekend in Taiwan. The top two candidates now in a dead heat at odds over whether Taiwan should defy China and move forward towards independence. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer has this report from Taipei. Taiwan's presidential election has been described as a choice between war and peace. With growing concerns, China could invade the self-governing island, which it considers its own territory. That looming threat both the biggest source of tension between the U.S. and China and the key issue at the center of this vote. The election here has become a very tight race and the outcome will reach far beyond Taiwan. William Lai with the ruling Democratic People's Party says he's ready to defy China. We have to win because we have to protect democracy. China sees Lai as favoring independence. Chinese military officials vowing today to smash any attempt at that. Polls show Lai neck and neck with Ho Yui of the Kuomintang Party, which is open to dialogue with the mainland. We can never ignore their existence, Ho says of China. Misunderstandings will lead to conflict. China makes no secret of its intentions when it comes to Taiwan. Xi Jinping in a New Year's speech saying reunification is inevitable. For years, China has increased surveillance, fighter jets, even missiles around the island. It's also ramping up disinformation, including messaging to sow doubt about U.S. health. Uh, the message is that there will be no knight in shiny armor to save you when things really go down. The third candidate, Ko Wenzhou, wants stronger ties to China and the U.S. Finding a balance between the two, he says, this is the toughest job for the Taiwanese president. A crucial vote for Taiwan, with the U.S. and China looming over it. Janice Mackey Freyer joins us now from Taipei, Taiwan. Janice, we know U.S. officials will be keeping an incredibly close eye on how this election breaks. What are we hearing tonight from the State Department ahead of the vote? Well, Taiwan remains a huge flashpoint between the U.S. and China. The U.S. could get drawn into any potential conflict here. All three candidates for president are saying they want to continue those strong ties with the U.S. and that strong military support that comes from the U.S. As far as the State Department, they're saying they will send a delegation here after the election. But by announcing it in advance, the Biden administration is is trying to telegraph the message that to the United States it doesn't matter who wins this presidential race as long as the election is a process that's seen as free and fair. Ellison. Janice, thank you. Now to top stories, Global Watch. Israel and Qatar have reached a deal that will allow the delivery of medicine to hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. More than 100 hostages remain in Gaza, many who are said to be elderly and suffering from chronic illnesses. The delivery is expected over the next few days. Monday marks 100 days since the Hamas terror attack on October 7th. Talks for another ceasefire or the release of more hostages remain stalled. And an electric double-decker bus bursting into flames in southwest London. New video shows flames and smoke shooting out of the bus during the morning commute. The bus was quickly evacuated and no one was hurt, but the fire did shut down roads. No words yet on what caused this fire, but there are reports of a second fire on a similar bus. And a bear rescued from war-torn Ukraine arrived at his new home. New video shows the rare Asiatic black bear settling in at a zoo in Scotland. The 12-year-old bear was one of the only surviving animals found at a bombed-out zoo in the Donetsk region in 2022. He was relocated to Belgium and then adopted by the Scottish Zoo. The bear was hurt in the bombing and still recovering. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Ellison Barber in New York. Stay right there. More news is on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.